In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, how nice it is to be back with you again this Sunday. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for all your fine comments, for your encouragement, and for the help that you're giving uh, for my cancer treatment. I appreciate that so very, very much. Tonight, we're going to talk about a saint, a Saint Tugdwal. He was a saint of the Celtic Orthodox Church, which is one of the very oldest churches in Christendom. It started in the year 37. And so it goes way, way back. And it was started by St. Joseph of Arimathea. St. Joseph of Arimathea, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, uh, the, the legal entity in, uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, he was a secret disciple of Christ. And he's the one who founded the first church of the Celtic Orthodox Church in Glastonbury, England. And uh, to this day, Glastonbury is still there. It's become sort of new age now, but uh, we, the, the original altar of the Virgin is still very much there. St. Francis of Assisi, centuries later, has the same spirit as St. Tugdwal, or St. Tugdwal has the same spirit as St. Francis. So if you know St. Francis, you already have an idea of St. Tugdwal, a uh, contemporary saint. He actually was born in uh, 1917, the year of Our Lady of Fatima. And uh, he was completely overwhelmed by the vision, just as St. Francis was, of the absolute of God, everything for God. God is the absolute. Without God, there is nothing. We don't exist. The cosmos doesn't exist. There ultimately is only God that we have to get to know, to love, to venerate, to appreciate the beauty, the kindness of him. His, his birth name was Jean-Pierre Daniel, uh, D-A-N-Y-E-L, not I-E-L. And uh, he had joined the army, the French army. He was born in what is now Normandy. Uh, he joined the French army. And in 1940, when the Nazis invaded France, he was taken prisoner. And he was put into a stalag, uh, a concentration camp, in uh, Prussia, in northern Germany, where he remained for four and a half years and it utterly demolished his health. He came out of there uh, weighing, oh, I think it was something like 74 pounds or 76 pounds. Uh, his health was broken. He couldn't even hold a spoon. And it took a long, t his health was forever broken, but uh, little by little he was able to do some things. As I said, his parents were atheists. They, Grandparents were atheists. But while he was in the concentration camp, a Belgian evangelical pastor spoke to him about Jesus Christ. And he came to believe in Christ. He came to believe ardently in Christ. And when he got out of the stalag, out of the concentration camp, he started searching all over in different churches to see where it was that God wanted him praying ardently, asking God for his light. And he finally became a priest in the Celtic Orthodox Church. That was in 1953. And then two years later, in 1955, uh, he moved into a marsh, a small marsh, a swamp, in Brittany, because he had a gift of healing and there was a young woman who was going blind. Her parents asked him to lay his hands upon her 
and he did as he blessed her, and she regained her sight. And because of that, they were people of means. They had three other properties besides their home. They said, we're going to show you the three properties. You choose the one that you want. And he chose what they thought was by far the worst one, this, this swamp. And they said, why are you going there? What do you want to live in a swamp for? He said, because here I have felt the presence of, of God. From a temporal and a religious point of view, his life there was very, very hard. In fact, it was a catastrophe. He was very much persecuted by outside of the church and even within the church. He became a bishop and his own priest because he had become so full of God, so full of the light and the love of God. There was such an absolute that he lived that they felt they couldn't keep up with him or didn't want to keep up with him. And they persecuted him. Uh, even some of the local people, for example, from the pulpit, people were told, don't sell them any bread. We'll force them out if they can't eat. Uh, however, one of the bakers, he said, well, if I'm forbidden to sell them bread, I'll give them bread. So they did get some bread after all, thanks to the kindness of this thing. But then other, some hooligans came and they smashed the windows of his, of his uh, little hut. And uh, he lived in the dire's poverty. He, he, he lived in great, great poverty. So what he was doing was going back to the early, early Celtic spirituality. This is what he wanted to reinstall, the Celtic spirituality, as it, as it was and as it produced so many saints, so many holy bishops and priests and monks and nuns and lay people for many centuries. This is what he wanted to renew and to reestablish. And what he did, and he was so caught up with the presence of God that... He began writing down his meditations in over 20 little notebooks that he wrote down all of these meditations. We have all but one of them today, so we can read exactly what he was saying, what he was thinking, what he was going through. And uh, he actually did restore Celtic monasticism. Even though he was there, he was finally abandoned by everybody. Everybody abandoned him. When it came time for him to die, he died all alone. He died alone. He was abandoned. But he died prophesying, saying that 10 years from now, monks will come and they're going to establish a monastery here where I am. And in fact, 10 years later, Bishop Mael, who was originally from Gardner, Massachusetts, by the way, Bishop Mark and uh, Father Jean, they came, just like he prophesied, and they established the monastery, which is still there to this day, which has grown tremendously. Bishop Mael gave a good deal of organization to the monastery. And uh, it has places in different parts of the world, in, in France, of course, many in France, Scotland, England, Australia, and now in the United States, we're here. And he did restore the absolute of God, the spirit of the absolute of God in monasticism. And he said, who is the true Christian? Who is the true monk? He said, it's the one who prays and who has experienced the light of Christ. Do you want to know whether you're a true Christian or a true monk or none? Do you pray all the time? He prayed all the time to the point where he felt bad if he had skipped some minutes of the day without thinking of God and without praying for God. Uh, he died in 1968. 
So uh, that was the year of his death, during our lifetime. Uh, he died and he was 51 years old. And when the other monks came, it was 1977 when they started to reestablish. And now it's well reestablished and, and it is spreading. There are parishes throughout the world. The extraordinary thing about St. Tugdwal is he lived in perpetual ravishment of God, of God's goodness, of his kindness, of his love, of his beauty, of his justice, of all of the qualities that we know of God. This left him in complete ravishment all the time. So, my brothers and sisters, this gives you a very, very little eyedropper view of St. Tugdual, a great, great saint, a St. Francis of Assisi of the modern times. If you have any questions, please ask me. I'll be glad to try and answer you. or any comments that you would like to make. And if not, I will tell you that next week we're going to speak about the Holy Eucharist. We're going to speak about communion. And uh, we, I hope we, you find that we'll have interesting things to say. God bless you. God keep you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.